Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to ALP YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be talking about ellipses. So ellipses are are quite a difficult math subject, but if you grasp like a few things about them, it'll be much easier than you think. So there's like a few main things about ellipses that I'll write down here. So first of all, you have an ellipse. It has these two points called foci or focus. So the thing about the focus is that every single point on the ellipse, the sum of the distances from that point to each of the foci is the same. So just to illustrate an example with GeoGebra. So here's my ellipse and A and B are the foci. And this point on the ellipse, like wherever I move it, the sum of the distances from D to A and B will all be the same. So that's like what defines an ellipse. It's like also, if you have like a rubber band wrapped around the foci and the third point, like if you move around the third point, it will trace out an ellipse. So that's like the definition of ellipses. There's some other cool things though. And one of those is that, so if I draw an ellipse and, and then if this is like a line of symmetry, you write down the ellipse and then this length is C and this vertical length, each of these two vertical lengths are B and then each of these two horizontal lengths are A. Then we have the equation C squared equals A squared minus B squared. It's kind of like the Pythagorean theorem, but not exactly. You may have seen this in like a school textbook or something, but it's actually really easy to prove. So. Let me switch to different color for a second. If we consider this yellow point right on the top of the ellipse, we know that the sum of the distances from the yellow point to each of the foci will add to the same number as when you take this red point right here and add them to and add the distances from the red point to each of the foci. And we actually know the sum of the distances from the red point to the foci. This distance is a minus C because this entire thing is A and then you take away C, so it's A minus C. And then the distance from the red point to the other focus is just A plus C for obvious reasons. So the sum of the distances from the red point to the foci is 2A, which means the sum of the distances from the yellow point up here to the two foci is also going to be 2A, which means that if I clear some of this stuff up, then we can see that each of these distances must be A because of symmetry. So now we have this little right triangle here in yellow with A, B, and C. And that gives us C squared equals A squared minus B squared. So that's the second cool thing about ellipses. Yeah, and then there's also one really important property about tangency. Like there's something cool that happens when you have a line that's tangent to an ellipse, but I'll go over that later. So, okay, for now, we're gonna start with a problem from 2001 Amy. Um, yeah, so you can see that it has an equation of an ellipse, which we will have to think about what equations of ellipses mean. So. Basically, an equation of an ellipse looks like this. Like this is the general form. Ax squared plus by squared equals r squared, where, where a, b, and r are constants. And of course, if the ellipse is not centered at the origin, it might be like instead of x, it might be x minus h, and instead of y, it might be y minus k. But this is like the this is like the general form. And it's really simple to see like how to see like how you might draw the ellipse using this equation because well obviously it's centered at zero zero so the ellipse is going to look something like this actually no let's draw the axes first so these are the axes then the ellipse is centered at zero zero and then so what we can do is just substitute zero for x and y if x equals zero then y squared equals r squared over b which means y equals r squared over b, well, the square root of that, or the negative square root of r squared over b. So basically, we will get these points for x equals 0 that are like, actually, let's do a different color. 
that are like up here and down here and they're like symmetric because it's negative and positive. Oops, let's shift that over. Yeah. And then same thing, if you substitute y in, you'll get like x equals, if you substitute y equals zero, you'll get like x equals some expression and negative of that. So then you get these like other two points on the sides here. And then to draw the ellipse, you just like draw it through these four points. Yeah. But anyway, back to the problem. So yeah, I'm moving a little bit, okay. So we have this equation, x squared plus four y squared equals four. So I guess we should start by drawing the ellipse using the same method that we just did. And we know that it's going to be centered at zero, zero, since it's just x and y and not x minus h or y equals k. So we know that it will be centered at zero, zero. So if we have the axes, then we can first substitute x equals zero. That gives us four y squared equals four, which means y equals one negative one, one or negative one, which means we have the points zero comma one, zero comma negative one, and then we can plot them. So zero comma one is here, zero comma negative one is here. And now we substitute y equals zero. So y equals zero then, x squared equals four, so x equals plus or minus two. So we have the points, um, yeah, okay, two comma zero and negative two comma zero, which are right here, here and here. Okay, so now we can draw in the ellipse like this. And then, it, so now we have to draw this equilateral triangle inscribed in the ellipse. So first of all, one vertex was, zero comma one, which is right up here. And then it says that one altitude is in the y axis, which means that it must look like this. I don't know, I don't know. Like you could just try drawing the equilateral triangle and that's the only configuration in which like the altitude would be in the y axis. So it has to be like that. And then these two points right here that are not one, that are not zero comma one, we can use variables to find where they are. So look at this triangle right here one that is shaded in. If this horizontal distance is A, then this point right here is going to be A comma one minus A root three. And this point right here is going to be negative A comma one minus A root three, just by like looking at the length and height of that triangle. So then we, we have a bit of information. We know that A comma one minus A root three is on the ellipse which means we can just substitute this point into the equation and we will get this. A squared plus four times one minus A root three squared equals four. And then if you solve that equation, then you'll get the value of A, which is, wait, hold on, what is the value of A? Oh yeah, so A becomes eight root three over 13. And then to finish the problem, it's really easy. The, the answer is just, well, the square of 2a, which is something 768 over 169 equals the square of 2a. So then the answer is just 937. Yeah, so it's just like a matter of finding out where to draw the triangle, and then the rest is just easy algebra. Okay. Now I'm going to talk a bit about area of ellipse because this is another interesting thing about ellipses. You can also kind of like, you might also notice that ellipses are basically squashed circles. Like if you have a circle and you squash it, then you get an ellipse. So, it, so you may know that the area of an ellipse with, with like this distance B and this distance A, oops, this is a very bad ellipse. So it looks like that. This ellipse has area a b pi. And yeah, it's pretty easy of a form. It's pretty easy to memorize. And it's even easier if you like think about a circle, because circles are ellipses. They're a subset of ellipses. Then these two lanes would just be like, let's say they're one, and then the area of the circle is obviously one pi. So like that might help you remember the formula. Anyway, this next problem will be using that formula. 
So, okay, so this next problem is from DMM 2009, but I modified it so that the numbers would be nicer. So, okay, we have another equation of an ellipse. I can write it out bigger, x minus five squared over five plus x, we know y minus 20 squared over 20 is less than or equal to 2000. So here we have a translated ellipse, which means it's not centered at the origin, it's centered at five comma 20. Okay, so what else can we figure out about the ellipse? Well, obviously, all we want to do is basically graph it because we want to find like areas. So first, we might like rewrite the equation in an easier way. We can rewrite it as 20 times x minus 5 squared plus 5 times y minus 20 squared is less than or equal to 100 times 2,000, I think. Yeah. And then we can do the same like substitution thing, substituting zero for x and y to figure out where like the where like the extreme value points are. Oops, that's kind of off the screen. Okay, anyway, yeah. So if we try substituting, if we try substituting x equals zero, then we get this this entire term right here equals this entire term right here. Wait, no, sorry, I did not mean x equals zero. I meant x minus five equals zero. Because since it's translated, you want like, you want to kind of eliminate one of the terms. And you and the way you do that is by setting x minus five equals zero, because then this entire first term vanishes since zero times anything is zero. So we substitute x minus five equals zero. And then we get this whole thing is less than or equal to this whole thing. But for the sake of drawing the ellipse, we can just turn this less than or equal sign into an equal sign. So it's basically just equal. And then solving this, we get y minus 20 squared equals 20 times 2,000, which means y equals 220 or negative 180, which means we get the points 5 comma 220. And Five comma negative one eight. Okay, now we do the same thing, substituting y equals twenty. Yeah, y minus twenty equals zero. So if y minus twenty equals zero or y equals twenty, then this whole thing, just the first part, equals this, which means that x minus five squared equals five times 2000, which means that x minus five squared equals 100 squared. So x equals 105 or negative 95. So we get the points 105 comma 20 and negative 95 comma 20. So now we have our four points and now we can graph it, which I will make of you more space because it will take a bit of space to graph. Okay, so we have our axes. And by the way, we need to pay attention to which quadrants the different parts of the ellipse are in because we care about quadrants. So, okay, we're going to have this point up here and this point down here, and then this point here and this point here. That's basically what it will look like. And then it does that. Oh yeah, I'm gonna draw the center too, because that's important. But this is a really cool problem. Like I actually, let me tell you, I did act, I actually did not need to do all that algebra because the question, like there's actually a simpler, well, you'll see the solution is really simple and it will look like we didn't need to do that much work because like it's a really slick solution. Anyway, okay, so we have our four points and now Basically, we should look at like how much of the ellipse is in different quadrants. And maybe I'll use highlighter for that. Okay. So first of all, let's look back at the question and like look at exactly what we were trying to find. So in particular, we wanted to find R1 plus R3 minus R2 minus R4. So I'm going to shade in R1 and R3 with this color because 
these two, we basically like combine them to form like one region because they're like together basically. Okay. Now these look like really weird regions because they're not nice shapes. So how might we find, how might we make these like shapes easier to find the area? Well, I think it's a good idea to draw these lines because these four lines that I'm drawing right now are actually lines of symmetry. So I'll make them a little easier to see. These lines are, are the lines like cutting the ellipse in half horizontally and vertically, which means that we can do this cool thing. So, okay, we can actually kind of like move parts of the ellipse into different faces. So do you see this square right here that I'm coloring in like bluish? If you reflect that over this horizontal line, then you get like this square right here. See how there's like two squares? Which means that, okay, I'll use different colors. Which means that this section right here, that, that is like dark blue, you can reflect this section over the same horizontal line and get this section down here. It kind of just all fits together. And then you can do the same thing with, with like the horizontal strip. So let's switch back to greenish. This rectangle right here that is colored in with green is also the same as this one right here. And we will figure out the exact lengths eventually, but first we're just dealing with like shapes. So then we can take this purple thing and plop it over on the left. And the reason why we're doing all this like shifting around is because we're trying to make the areas easier to find. So we're trying to make them easier shapes. And you know how it's always like nice if you have a circle that's cut into perfect fourths, right? But it isn't nice if you have like random cuts that you don't know their size. So we're making, we're basically trying to make this into nice fourths because the horizontal and vertical lines of symmetry cut it into fourths, which is very nice. So anyway, we take that purple rectangle over there and move it over here. It's like we're fitting together a puzzle. So then, okay, what do we know now? So basically R1 plus R3 is actually equal to, okay, let's do like a bright color. It's actually equal to the part outlined in red. So first we had this part, which we did not like move because we did not move any of this. So this is, was like what is left of R1. And then R3 became this entire thing. So this is R3. And I'll like color it in, in red so it's easier to see. So we basically just moved around this green and blue pieces. So now R1 plus R3 looks like this red shape, which is actually extremely nice because now what it basically is, is like two quarters of the ellipse because like these are two quarters, the bottom left one and the top right one, plus these two little rectangles, these two, which we can actually find the area of. Because if you notice, each of those rectangles was equal to the shaded in green rectangle. And if I just draw like a tiny diagram off to the side, that shaded in green rectangle was like basically bounded by zero comma zero, which is the bottom left point, and five comma 20, which is the top right point, because five comma 20 is just the center of the ellipse. So the shaded in green rectangle, we actually know its area. Its area is five times 20, which is 100. So the rectangle has area 100, which means that, let me to white, R1, so R1 plus R3 is actually equal to half total area of the ellipse plus an extra two green rectangles, which is an extra 200, which means that, wait, oops, you can't, can't see this. Okay, which means that R2 plus R4, since it's like the part left over, must be equal to half of the total area minus 200. And then this is really convenient because the question was asking for R1 plus R3 minus R2 plus R4, which is just, well, all of this stuff cancels out. 
all of this canceled out. So all we're left with is this. So the answer is 400. 200 minus negative 200. And so we're done. That was a very cute problem. OK. Now time for a slightly harder problem by Square Man. Well, it's from ADMC. And yeah, it looks pretty long. So this is where we'll have to talk about tangents, because this problem has tangents. So first of all, I'll state the fact that you will need to know about tangents to ellipses. So here's an ellipse. It's a really badly drawn one. And suppose these are the two foci. Then suppose there's a point like over here that, that the tangent hits the ellipse at. So this will be a really bad drawing, but there's a tangent right here that hits the ellipse at this red point. Then if we draw the segments from the red point to the two foci, this red line is actually perpendicular to the angle bisector of this yellow angle, which I'll draw in blue. So if blue is the angle bisector, then red and blue are perpendicular. That's the important thing. So red plus the blue, are perpendicular. So that's basically that's basically what you will need to know for this problem. Anyway, this problem has a lot to tackle because the first part is two tangent circles that are inside an ellipse. So I'll show what that means or how that will look. So we have like two tangent circles that look like this. That was bad. Like this. And then we have this ellipse going like this but we don't exactly know how it goes. So the first part of this problem is figuring out exactly how the ellipse like surrounds the two tangent circles, which we will actually use this tangent, this tangency thing for. So first of all, since the ellipse, so how about let's make this left circle red? Okay. Oh yeah, and it also tells us that the foci of the ellipse are here, which is very important. Because if we if we call this one tangency point like the red point, then we can draw like a tangent that's tangent to the ellipse. And it's also tangent to this left red circle, which means that if we draw the, the angle bisector of the yellow angle, which I'll use blue again for, then this will have to be perpendicular to the red thing to the red tangent line. But also, since the red tangent line is also tangent to the, to the left circle, it also must be tangent to the yellow radius, which I will draw here. So how is that possible? How is this red line perpendicular to both the yellow line and the blue line? Well, the only solution is if the yellow line is the blue line, which means that, actually this means that um, the red line must be, must be like, vertical because I'll, I'll draw what happens in the red line is vertical and then it will make more sense. So if the, if the red line is vertical, then basically what's that, what that's telling us is that the ellipse looks like this. Like it's literally just hugging the two circles. And then the red line is vertical like this. And the blue line and the yellow line are both horizontal because First of all, the yellow line must be horizontal because it's like this. And then the blue line, since it's a bisecting this angle like that, which is like horizontal, it obviously must be horizontal. So the blue line is also horizontal. So this is the only case in which it works. This case up here is irrelevant because that's a wrong diagram. So now we know that the diagram must look like this. Yay, we're like 10% progress. Okay. So now, but there's a lot more things to also figure out. So first of all, we need to draw this line G through G, B, and H, which I'll need a bigger diagram for. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, actually, there's one more thing that we can do now. So we can use the, we can figure out more lengths of like the ellipse. Wait. Okay, that's slightly better, I think. Okay, yeah. So actually one thing that we can do right now is figure out like 
how far away this top point is. I'm calling it the top point because it's like the top point of the ellipse if the line to the foci is horizontal. But we actually know that the radius that these that both of these circles have radius too, which means that each of these four segments has length two. So this is two, 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 and two. Which means that, like, you know how there's a common distance from the point on the ellipse to the two foci? Like, when you add those distances, it's always constant. So we actually know what that is, because if we just consider this point and then add up the distances, it becomes two plus six equals eight. So we know that the common sum or whatever is eight, which means that, like, this is an equilateral triangle, basically, from the top point to the two foci because each side is four, since by symmetry, both of those must be four. So that's a cool thing. Now we kind of know more about the ellipse, but uh, now we have to actually get to the real problem. So I'll erase this quickly. And then we can draw the line that we actually need. Okay, so we have points G, B, and H that are collinear. So I'm gonna use red for this. They're going to look something like this. If this is B and then this is A, so AH is less than AG, so this should be H and this is G. Okay. And then we have some tangents, which we already know something about tangents. So maybe this should not be that bad. I think it will be useful to draw HA and GA because of the fact that we know about tangents. So, first of all, let's draw the tangent. It will look like something like this. And then this is P. And then now, now we can use the thing we knew about tangents. So we know that PH is perpendicular to this blue line and that PG is perpendicular to this greenish line. And furthermore, the blue line and the green line are angle bisectors of AHG and AGH, which means that I'll draw some angles that are equal. These blue, line, these blue angles are both equal and these green angles are both equal. So this may look a little bit suspicious because, wait, yeah. Yeah, so AP intersects the angle bisector of AHB at, at Q and the angle bisector of AHB is actually the blue line. So basically AP intersects the blue line at Q. Maybe I'll draw that in red. So this point right here is Q. Now it kind of looks suspicious, doesn't it? It kind of looks like maybe the green line also intersects those other two lines at Q. Does it really though? Maybe we can try to prove that. So backtracking, or not backtracking, but going on a little tangent, um, basically what we have is like, okay, so we want to prove that that G, that the green line also intersects those other two lines at Q, right? So basically all we have to do is prove this. If we have a triangle, any arbitrary triangle, and these are the two angle bisectors of the angles, by the way, this is A, H, and G, then if these are the two lines perpendicular to I feel let's let this be the in center perpendicular to H I and G I. Then, yeah. Then, then this is P. Yeah. Okay. Then we basically just want to prove that A I and P are collinear, right? Because P is like P is like the equivalent of P in this diagram. And H and G are the equivalents of H and G in that diagram. And Q is the equivalent of I in this diagram. So we basically just want to prove that if these two angles are the same, so like H, I is that angle bisector, and these two angles are also the same, so G, I is also an angle bisector, then A, I, and P will be collinear, which actually, this is a very commonly known fact. There are many ways to prove it. One of them is by the in-center, x-center lemma, because actually the circumcircle of AHG passes through the midpoint of, of the segment IP, which is actually the midpoint of arc HG. And then like, you can also show that MI equals MG equals MH, which will then equal MP. And then like by, by like right triangle stuff, 
obviously angle IHP and IGP are equal. So basically this is just trivial by the in center, X center of them. Yeah, quickly writing this down. I know this is a pretty convoluted problem. This is not the typical gaming problem. It's a bit of a challenge. So anyway, anyway, now we know that the green line also intersects the blue line and the dotted red line at Q, which is convenient because then we know that Q is the in center of triangle AHG, which is really good. So let's write that down because that's important. Q equals in center of triangle AHG. Okay, so now we haven't actually finished like reading the problem yet though. So we have another piece of information, which is that the line through Q perpendicular to GH is tangent to the circle centered at B. So, okay, we'll have to use some lengths for this, but I think it will be much clearer if we completely remove P from the diagram and only focus on triangle AHG. So I'm gonna draw another diagram with only triangle AHG and it will be a really bad diagram, but yeah. Okay, so A, H and G, and then Q also. This was not a straight line. Okay, so this is Q. And we know that Q is in center. And then we have this like altitude, right? I'll draw this in yellow. Does it have like the name of that point? No, it doesn't. Okay, so I guess I'll just name this point like X then. Okay, and then we know that somehow X is X, well, QX is tangent to the circle centered at B. So we'll also draw B. B is like over here some, somewhere. Okay, actually, hold on a second. There is another really important thing to notice about this diagram. So going back to like the very first facts we learned about ellipses, we actually know something about triangle AHG, which is that if you look at AH and BH, well, since H lies on the ellipse, we know that HA plus HB equals six. Because it's the sum of the lengths from H to the two foci. And similarly, GA plus GB equals six. So wait, no, not six, eight. Yeah, eight. So these will be really important pieces of information. Now let's go back here and and look very closely at something for a second. Actually, yeah, let's do this. So let's draw all the altitudes from Q to the three sides, because this is a really cool configuration. And let's call them Y and Z. So now we have like three altitudes, right? And then we actually know that, well, obviously these are right angles. And then there's a bit of like congruence here, or, or what's it called? Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, symmetry, that was the word. So anyway, these two red, red segments are obviously equal because of these congruent triangles, HZQ and HXQ. And then also, not yellow, also these two segments are equal for that same reason. And these two segments are also equal for that same reason. And if you look very closely at this, this means that orange, wait, yeah, orange plus red plus blue equals half times perimeter of the triangle, which means that, yeah, and this is actually kind of cool because we also knew that something else was half of the perimeter. We also knew that AH plus HB was half of the total perimeter, and the other half of the total perimeter was a G plus a G B. So this actually means that that H B must be the blue segment because see we have the orange segment right here and the red segment right there. So in order to complete the half perimeter or semi perimeter, H B must be the blue segment. So that A H plus H B is half of the perimeter. And similarly, since A G already contains the yellow segment and the blue segment, B G must be the red segment. So basically we have this. So basically what this tells us is that HX equals BG. 
this is really important. Okay, now um, I will need to, I'm gonna like erase this nice diagram because we will need to draw some other stuff on the triangle. So yeah, but that's a really important piece of information. And then if we use this and also the, the fact that like both of those things, both of those sums were eight, then that's actually enough to finish the problem. Okay, let's use white. Okay, so we have A, H, and G, and then we have Q, and then this yellow segment. I'm not going to draw Y and Z this time, only X. So this is X. Yeah, and then this is B, which now we have another definition for B. It's just like, it's just like X, but symmetric to G instead of H. It's basically just that B is a reflection of X over the perpendicular bisector of GH. So now let's write everything in variables. Oh, and by the way, we know that AB equals four because this is like one of our very first pieces of information. So we know that AB is four, that's important. And now let's draw some segments. So HX equals BG, and let's call both of those X. I know there's two X's right now, a point and a segment, but hopefully they won't be too confusing. And then we know that AH, which will be yellow, is six minus X. Because, by, oh yeah, by the way, we know that BX is two because it's the radius of the circle. So the so length of AH is just eight minus X minus two, basically. And then, Last but not least, that in the length of AG is eight minus X. Okay, so now this, this configuration might look really familiar to you because it's just Stewart's theorem. We just have basically a triangle. If you ignore Q, it's just a triangle with a Chevian. And then all we have to do is Stewart's theorem on this, which is X, wait. So X plus two, times x times 2x plus 2 plus ab squared times hg, which is 4 squared times 2x plus 2 equals 8 minus x squared times x plus 2 plus 6 minus x squared times x. And I'm not going to go through how to solve this entire equation, but like it's basically just algebra. And then at the end, you get x equals I actually remember this one, one plus root 13 over two. And then since the answer was HG, and by the way, this is H, the answer is just X, two X plus two. So therefore the answer is two, one plus root 13 over two plus two, which is three plus root 13. And then that gives a final answer of three thirteen to put it in the right form. Yeah. So. That's this problem. It was pretty convoluted, but it's one of my favorite problems of all time. And so you saw three very different examples of applications of ellipses in this YouTube video. I hope you learned something. Thank you. Bye.